Got everything ready almost. So remember all we are being recorded for posterity. So this will help others down the road. Okay, well, I understand we're all on this webinar this morning. Uh, it's 11 o'clock. We'll wait about a minute to let everybody get in and make sure you're settled uh, for this hour uh, and then we'll start. So go ahead and if you need to get something uh, and you're ready to watch and uh, ask questions, uh, go ahead and get settled in and we'll start in about a minute. Okay, it looks like maybe it's time uh, to go ahead and start this webinar, give you a full hour of advice and information and a chance to maybe ask questions of the three patients that we have with us today. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, the webinar today. This is our patient webinar during MSA Awareness Month. It's hosted by the Multiple System Atrophy Coalition. Uh, if you've seen our um, banner there on the screen a little earlier, uh, we are a supporting uh, coalition for uh, members of the world, I guess you'd say, about 318,000 patients worldwide and 15 to 25,000 patients in the United States. Those who have MSA uh, cerebellar, MSA Parkinson's, and atypical Parkinsonism, and maybe some of the other um, nomenclatures that have been given to a disease um, that is impacting both your uh, ataxia and your uh, autonomic nervous system. We have three patients here today, and uh, I am here to be the host. My name is Larry Kellerman. I'm a member of the board of the directors for the Multiple System Atrophy Coalition and became a member because my wife, uh, Mary Colleen, was a patient. And as her caregiver, I uh, and she attended a couple of conferences and ultimately um, she passed away, but I decided I wanted to stay on, and, and it's been a wonderful experience helping others and um, meeting many of the patients um, that uh, have made it through the years since my wife passed. The three patients we have today, I'm going to introduce them one at a time. We're doing it in alphabetical order, and they're each going to share a bit about their journey to this point, and then we'll get started with uh, questions and issues that you might want to raise. So the first patient that we have is Isabel Cote, and Isabel is uh, here to share a bit uh, about uh, what she's been going through in, in her life thus far. So Isabel, you want to start? Yeah, hi, good afternoon, or good morning. What time is it, 11 o'clock? In some places. <laughs> so anyway, I'm a forensic psychiatrist, so um, and um, I was diagnosed with MSA in 2019. It's been a very difficult journey because I had a big career. And um, so that's not anymore. I feel like I have a, I've, I'm not doing anything like I used to. And, um, and um, it started with motor symptoms and having trouble they getting out of the car, and then it, my writing went, and then my speech was started being affected. I used to talk a lot, but not anymore. And um, it's been uh, very hard because uh, of all the losses I've experienced. But I try to keep up to a piece, a piece uh, despite the illness. I don't know what else to say. I, uh, that's a good start. We'll find out more later, I'll bet, as we go along. The second patient we have with us today is Kathy Chapman. And Kathy is a member of our board of directors as the patient representative. So, Kathy, if you'd like to share a bit as well, we'd appreciate it. Welcome, everybody. It's nice to be here. 
Um, I have uh, MSA salivalar. I was diagnosed nine years ago. Um, I started out with balance and coordination issues and many falls. Um, that's what led me to seek um, uh, doctor's help. Um, I still am independent. I use walking sticks, um, a walker and wheelchair as, as I need, need to. Um, my caregiver is my husband because he does all of the driving and he does all of the household chores. Um, my uh, symptoms have been fairly slow, except for the past year. They have sped up somewhat, but uh, that's been my journey thus far. Okay. Thank you, Kathy, very much. And our third patient and uh, caregiver to help as well is Jim Davis. And his wife, Melissa, has joined him today to help and maybe answer uh, other questions or uh, enhance what Jim tells you. So, Jim, if you'd like to share a bit about your journey and what's been going on with you thus far, we'd appreciate it. Sure. Uh, I've been diagnosed with MSA cerebellar also, and um, I'm very involved with clinical trials. And I figure if I can't help myself, I'm helping someone. Um, the I'm not able to do anything. I used to used to be a workaholic and work on everything. Now I don't do anything. Mm -hmm. uh, this past year or so, I've uh, experienced some progression, okay. mainly with my speech. Mm -hmm. But uh, we got to, you know we travel a lot. So I'm getting to see the sights. Good, good. So I'm Melissa and um, he was diagnosed in 2017, um, about, about this time. Um, and uh, it started for him with falling and he's a pretty sure-footed sailor kind of guy. And so when he started tripping and falling and not being able to catch himself, he began to be pretty concerned. And then he thought that he sounded funny. So um, we did a CAT scan to find out if he had a stroke. And that led to MSA because he had not had a stroke. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. Now, you've heard from all three of them and a bit about what their journey has been like to this point. Uh, I do want to let you know now that if there are any questions that you'd like to ask right off the bat, uh, please use the Q&A that is at the bottom of the page. I think our, our hostess today is Cassie, and Cassie has been kind enough, I see already, to tell a few people to do that. So if you do have questions, uh, please go through that Q&A and then I'll relate them to the patients and we'll uh, get you the answers uh, that you have. We did in advance prepare to have a few questions that might uh, trigger some ideas for you. And so I want to start and I'll let either one of the three of you patients who would like to start um, respond first. And the first question we had was, uh, what did you know about MSA when you were diagnosed? And what resources have you used or have been useful to you in getting a better understanding of what this disease is and how to progress through it? Which of the three of you would like to respond first? Well, when I was diagnosed, I did not know anything about MSA. Okay. Nothing like I, I knew about Parkinson's because I was diagnosed first with Parkinson's. And then I had an MRI that the doctor did not want me to have, but I had it. And uh, that, that showed that I had an MSA, but the doctor did not believe it. But, uh, now, then I saw some specialist um, who told me I had MSA, so then I was diagnosed the year after 2019. And what I did is I started reading everything I could and I used an MSA coalition too. I went to their first uh, conference in 2019, no, 2018. 
2018, the first conference I went to, the Mesa Commission. Well, first we, we talked to Larry. We talked to you, Larry. Okay. Uh, Okay. Uh, any uh, either of the others of you want to share briefly what you you did? You I don't think Isabel you addressed any resources. Were there resources that helped clarify what it was that you did have once you got the diagnosis? Well, I, I read the the literature on MSA. Okay. I research papers. Okay. And then the MSA coalition also was very instrumental to help me understand. Okay. Okay. Any of the others of you, either Jim or Kathy, want to address it? Kathy, go ahead. Uh, yes. Uh, I knew nothing about it either. Um, my uh, doctor did explain. And then I went in and uh, found the MSA coalition. And I also attended uh, several of the um, family patient conferences, conferences, and that's where I gained my uh, knowledge. And um, also as my doctor's appointments, uh, each doctor's appointment, he, he confirmed and uh, went over everything with me. Uh, so that's where I have gained my most is through the coalition okay. and th with others. Okay. Uh, I have questions now that are coming in. So we'll just kind of go to what the audience would like to hear. Jim, there was one, there was one for you while from your introduction. Uh, and Emily asked, uh, can you explain more about your specific treatments? Uh, yes, uh, the, uh, the, really the neurologist is just logging my progression things. Uh, the, uh, I am affiliated with uh, a sport group, MSC coalition, and the, uh, Michael J. Fox Foundation, but um, as far as uh, what's been happening with me is the uh, I have low blood blood pressure, and I take a medication to increase my blood pressure. Other than that, I want no no medication whatsoever. Okay, very good. And um, to go along with uh, that. Uh, either one of the three of you would. I'm going to skip down a couple of questions. Uh, one question came in, how often do you exercise and what type of diet do you follow? So which one of you would like to start uh, responding to that? Uh, might go along with that question that was just asked about what kind of treatment do you have? What, how do you address the diet and taking care of yourself? I can add in some information real quick on that. Um, when we were first diagnosed with this, we went to a movement specialist here in Austin, and he said uh, one of the really uh, important things to do was to do a pea protein uh, type shake um, each morning. So from the day of that person saying that until this day, every single morning, we have had a pea protein and we put in um, uh, vegetables, uh, yeah, superfood, greens, and we have that every single morning to start the day. Um, our initial uh, uh, treatments and stuff like that were, you know, trying some of those Parkinson's uh, medications um, that they usually find help for, oh, I don't know, a, a few months. And as you progress, it doesn't seem to help as much. The Cordidopa, Libidopa, type mm -hmm. medicines, um, but we, we were very strict on diet right away, trying to keep the sugars down and, you know, increase the protein, the exercise. We've done physical therapy since day one, um, walking, bicycle riding, very, very important um, uh, to do. And uh, unfortunately, the, the diet part has kind of gone we still do our shakes, but he does a lot of cookies now too. 
Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Cheating a little bit, Jim. Uh-huh. We understand. <laughs> Now, uh, another question that came up, Kathy had said she was MSA cerebellar patient. Uh, are either the other two of you an MSA Parkinson's patient by I any am, chance? I am an MSAP. You're an MSAP? So yeah. Kathy and Isabel, Kathy, you want to tell, there, one of the questions was, what is the difference between the two types of MSA? Kathy, you want to speak briefly to maybe a, symptoms that you have and Isabel, maybe a couple of the symptoms you have, and that would work. So Kathy, you want to go first? Sure. Um, I'm cerebellar type, and mine is the uh, coordination and balance. Uh, um, and I, I do ha am getting quite a bit of weakness in my legs. But that was in the beginning. That was my main, uh, the coordination and balance. Um, and I had a wide gait. Uh, that was one of uh, the symptoms that the doctor noticed first off that I had a wide gait. Okay. And um, so that that was my main uh, problem in the beginning. Okay, Isabel, what what was it that kind of made you an MSAP patient? The motor symptoms, radicalnesia. Chuckling, the slow to move, slowness in general, slow thinking in general. Um, um, Did you have a loss of coordination? Did, were you like uh, the MSAC patient? Were you with lack of less loss of coordination and falling? Was that a problem for you? No, we were uh, falling a little bit, but not not because of uh, like. Not because of cerebellar symptoms, just because of weakness. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So two different types. One MSA cerebellar is, as Kathy said, uh, usually seen with the balance issues and lack of coordination or loss of coordination. Uh, the MSA Parkinson's typically, as she has said, is somewhat similar to Parkinson's. You might have tremors or shuffling feet, and then some of the other symptoms then begin to look or appear like. Um, uh, the MSAC and they begin to blend together. Jim and uh, Melissa, do you have anything to add from your diagnosis? We're cerebellar also. Okay. And pretty much follow what Kathy is saying about those same symptoms. Okay. Very good. Um, now, one of the other questions that was brought up, uh, actually a couple could be answered. Uh, talk about different clinical trials and then uh, one asked, Jim, what is the MSA study that you were participating in? So we'll start with that first since it's asked to you, and then maybe we can talk about clinical trials that any of you have thought about. Yes, I, uh, I did a clinical trial out of New York that was with serolimus, and which is a FDA-approved drug, but there is no benefit to it. Uh, the second one I did was with, with uh, Biohaven. That was a uh, Vertispat, I believe, medication. It was a phase three trial, but they've discovered that there's no benefit to that drug either. So, um, but it was a phase three trial and it was an open label and I'm still on it. The next one I'm doing is with a skin graft to uh, they'll graph my skin in three different places, trying to uh, diagnose for sure lab MSA. Okay. So you participated in three studies. Uh, yep. Well, we haven't started the skin biopsy yet, but we've oh, done yeah. a, a few others that were just observational and questionnaire kind of. Okay. Um, but yes, we've we've gone to New York um, for that study, and it was like every three months we flew up there, and then Dallas, we're going up there every so often. the The cool thing is, I'm just to add a little something about the Dallas trial. The Vertistat, um, the study showed that it did not have significant results or uh, to compare the two of a placebo and a patient, but 
the doctors that were dealing with Jim said that it really showed significant difference in him. And there are probably other MSA patients that have been benefiting from it. So they've asked us to continue with the trial so they could gather more data and maybe adjust the medication so that it could be more beneficial later down the road. And that's why we do the clinical trials is to, to develop stuff to help others further down this road. And I highly recommend that you get involved with clinical trials. That's my two cents. Very good. Kathy and uh, Isabel, you have anything uh, to add to that? Yeah, I was in the bioregion study for a year in New York. Um, I traveled from Hamilton, Ontario to New York. But I think that I, I think I was on the placebo the first year because but we, I don't know what I was on. It was ne nobody knows that I guess what, uh, what they were on. But then I went on to the open label for I uh -huh. go on the open label part of the study. And that, so then I get started to take the medication and I didn't tolerate it. I you didn't to, tolerate it. No, I had to stop. Okay. Um, so you tried, you weren't sure whether you had the placebo or the drug, but then they put you on the on label once the, the trial ended and you found that you weren't able to tolerate it. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Kathy? Any, any I have not. Anything? I have not had uh, been on any trials. No. Okay. Uh, one thing I can add for you uh, all is if indeed you are interested uh, in participating in a trial, if you have uh, uh, an opportunity to do so, uh, you can find out about uh, clinical trials available for MSA patients through uh, clinicaltrials.gov and or through our website. And toward the end of our uh, time here, I'll uh, share my screen and show you how to get to that particular part of our uh, web uh, pages where you can find out more about clinical trials. So that was a very good question to ask. Clinical trials are important. As I think Melissa said, you want to help those in the future and uh, finding out about a clinical trial, participating uh, helps provide information, uh, not only for yourself, but for others that might be coming up in the future. Uh, I had another question all of you might be willing to answer. What strategies have you found most beneficial in managing the day-to-day -day symptoms of MSA? And uh, whichever one of you would like to start, are there some symptoms that, are there some strategies that you have found that really help you? Well, mentally, exercising for me was the, the, the savior. I exercised a lot initially. I was growing, I was growing an exercise of my, my, my max heart rate six minutes, four times a week. Uh, so pumping my heart was very good. So I did that for about two years and then uh, then I couldn't do it anymore because I was too worn out when I, after a run. So now I, so I, now I, I walk only 20 minutes. Okay. But I still try to wear it out. Okay. But, um, so I decided it would be safer for me. So in your case, exercise and working out has been a real good strategy to help with the symptoms. Yeah. Good. Uh, Jim, Melissa, how about you? How have you been able to deal with the uh, day-to-day symptoms? Mainly, I have been uh, like a I'm, I'm very careful. I don't want to fall and hurt myself. Okay. Um, that is the main thing, as well as the support group that I go to that, uh, you know, it's good to see other people that have this disease. And uh, through that support group, I do. Good. A lot, you know, I progressed quite a bit this past year. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I'm very careful with everything. Walking, you name it. Good. That's a good strategy. Yeah, very good. Kathy, have you got anything to add? Uh, well, I agree with um, trying to stay as active as possible safely. Um, fatigue is an issue. And so for me <clears throat> with that, I have to um, take things slow. Um, 
if I have an activity that I want to do, um, I will rest the day before and the day after if it's something special I want to do. But I try to pace myself out. And sometimes if I only get one thing done in that day, that's okay. Uh, at least I got one thing done. So uh, fatigue can be a real issue. Um, it's just um, trying to um, rest when you can and, and when you can do something uh, to, to do it. Very good. Yes, fatigue is a real issue. As many of you, as any many of you who are participating or attending today have found out, uh, fatigue can be an issue. And so whatever strategies help you be prepared. And I think Kathy's got a good idea. Rest and do what you can on a day and realize that uh, you may have to put something off for another day. Um, that's a good, good response. I've had this question come up a lot of times. And so let's see how the three of you dealt with this. When is it uh, okay to stop driving or should you drive or can you drive or what, what was the strategy that was used? <laughs> I see Melissa already laughing. So <laughs> what are the strategies used to stop driving or are any of you still driving? You're not anymore? No. And what, what, how did you, did you just decide to stop? Did somebody have to talk you into it or? I guess I did. Okay. Safety concerns? Yeah, I'm, I'm a, a, a thing that if I was going to be arrested and I would be transitioned and, and also get the new case. Okay. Okay, Jim, Melissa? Well, I have to stop driving also. Melissa drives everywhere. Okay. Uh, Man, they can't turn my head up or down or left or right. And I noticed it was bad to drive so i i quit on my own did you yeah i was watching you know when i rode with him when he was driving you know he tended to stay kind of towards the center of the road too mm -hmm. much and um i was getting a little concerned we were going to get hit right and so i said you know keep moving over and that progressed um we just kept getting a little scarier and he started slowing down so much. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was going like 50 miles an hour instead of 60 or 65 where it was legal. And um, that wasn't normal for him. Um, he's always driven a little bit quicker than that. So um, so I was noticing some changes there. And I I have to agree, he, he pretty much decided that on his own because um, he couldn't, he would get very, uh, uncoordinated and dizzy turning left to right and you can't do that when you drive no very true and same same with you Kathy were you one that gave up the car readily the driving readily yes I gave up driving two years in and the same I was hugging the center of the road and I knew that I was slow to react and when I drive through town, I knew that I was really close to parked cars. And that's what made me decide to, to give it up. Okay. Now you've heard from these three and they willingly gave it up after either discussion, like between Melissa and Jim, maybe, or uh, they just gave it up because they realized it was unsafe. There are people who maybe are a bit less willing to give up driving or they need further confirmation. And we have had patients uh, who've talked to us and said that, and caregivers as well, have said being able to go in and get a uh, driver's test and have a person that is in the driver's office telling the patient you can no longer drive may take a bit of pressure off of a spouse who is, as Melissa said, maybe a little worried about the driver and the driver is and not quite as cooperative as Jim, maybe having someone else uh, explain why driving is not good, going through a driver's test can help address that. So uh, if you're asking because uh, you want to worry about the driver, there are ways that you can help make sure that uh, the safety is um, taken care of in that respect. Uh, we have one here, uh, the question is, 
uh, a husband has been has had MSA for five years and struggles with dizziness, but not blood pressure related. Do any of you three have issues with dizziness that is not related to uh, might be called neurogenic orthostatic hypotension? Would no. that be something? No, I don't have that. You do not. How no. about how about you, Kathy? I do not have it. Okay, Jim. Uh, not dizziness, it's more of a balance problem. Okay. With, when I'm working low and stand up, I'll get a little, it's not dizzy, it's just off balance and unstable. Okay. But that's blood pressure. Right. Okay. From your case, it is blood pressure. Now, it doesn't seem like any of the three here uh, have that, and that is something that if you are worried about it, uh, as a patient and or as a caregiver, you probably ought to get a hold of your movement disorder specialist. And I think all of these people will agree if, if you want to address it. When you feel something come on that is something you've not felt before or something that seems unusual, are you, all three of you, able and willing to get a hold of your movement disorder specialist and ask the questions and make sure? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, our ours uh, answers our questions immediately. She is absolutely wonderful. Good. And Kathy, you the same? Yes, very much so. Good. Yeah, that's one way to, if you are experiencing symptoms, it would be very good to, as quickly as you can, maybe get a hold of your movement disorder specialist or um, a social worker and try to get that addressed. Because not all are caused by the neurogenic orthostatic hypertension, and it could be something else that's causing that issue. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jim, you told us about, you told him you were traveling, and uh, Kathy, you said you had traveled earlier to Mississippi. Uh, we, they'd like to ask, what are the efforts involved in order to facilitate the traveling that you guys have done? What, what happens both at home before you go, and maybe what happens at the airport when you get there? Well, lately, I wasn't very progressed early on, but lately I've been running a, a electric scooter, which helps the persons with me and me myself. Uh, I can travel much more and just ride the scooter. Okay. Some what of the preparation. The oh, yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead with preparations. That's a good one. Well, the, the preparations at home, you know, when you first call to make arrangements, you really have to ask a bunch of questions. You know, you definitely have to have ADA accessible rooms. Um, I always make sure that I take all my extra um, grab bars that I have here at home, anything that I can put on the shower floor, just in case their shower floor is uh, in a hotel room is real slippery so that you don't slip. Um, then, you know, you just have to pack well before you leave. And then um, calling ahead, um, you know, when you, if you want to rent a car, when you get to the airport, um, you know, find out if the car, um, if they have wheelchairs with the rental company that will fit in the car. And um, the airport's great because they put you in a wheelchair right at the beginning. You usually have somebody that helps and wheels you right up to the front door. You're usually the first one on the airplane. Um, depending on the airline, you get to pick your seat. Um, then you get whisked off and down to baggage and right out the door. And then you have to make sure that the preparations of who picks you up um, has ability to put you on that particular public uh, bus or whatever it is to get to your location. So this Bahama trip that we've just planned for, we talked to a person there at the place we're going and they had everything lined out. And I also found that you can go online. There are many places that or websites that have um, where you're going and all the handicapped information you would need to get around in the area, if that helps any. That's very good, very thorough, excellent. Mm -hmm. Kathy or Isabel, do you have anything to add when from your travel experiences with the disease? Well, don't hesitate to ask for a wheelchair. 
wheelchair? Yes. Okay. yes. D Melissa, and, and when you went, does the airport provide the wheelchairs or do you make sure you take your portable wheelchair or whatever wheelchair you have with you? No, uh, they have them. Um, you usually check with your airline and make sure that they know that you're a handicapped person and that you need a wheelchair. Um, so far, um, the diff we've only used like Southwest and United and they always have the wheelchairs like right there at the door and you just get one and they'll either call a person to help wheel you or you can wheel. I've just taken Jim right up to the baggage claim and parked him and then got the baggage and took it up there. Okay. So um, I've, I've traveled with the wheelchair, but a lot of times you just don't need it because they are ready for that. That, okay. you know, is growing and growing population of people needing wheelchairs to get around. Very good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so thank you, all three of you. Uh, we have one, I'm just gonna return. There's some others in front, but just real quickly, there is a question. Can you please indicate again when each were diagnosed or noticed symptoms? So they're, I think, looking for length of time with diagnosis, since diagnosis, and maybe what number of years or number, uh, uh, how length the period of time was before you got the diagnosis. So Kathy, you said you were diagnosed nine years ago, is that correct? That's correct, yes. Okay. And um, how long before did you feel the symptoms that led to this? Uh, two years prior, I was having a lot of undiagnosed heart and lung um, issues, uh, arrhythmias. Um, and the interesting thing, I would go through batteries of tests and I, I would always end up at being sent to a neurologist. And I, I always found that kind of interesting when with those two things being the main concern, uh, but nothing was ever found. But in 2012, I uh, had come back from a, a trip to see family in New Hampshire and I started having the balance issues and coordination issues. They thought it at first was uh, just ear, inner ear issues. And then when they discovered that I was walking with a gait and uh, I was had, when I had a doctor's appointment, I cut the wall short and I was running into the walls. And so it really wasn't in 2000, until 2012 that I started having the coordination and balance and falling issues. Okay, thank you. Isabel? Uh, my first motor symptoms were in April 2016, but I think I may have had the disease before because I had me in May in 2013. But my, 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 and I got to dismiss that as a support system because I had a, I had a full test and it, my, my body was normal. But I think that just like maybe that was a sign of the illness. But my motor symptoms started in 2016 and I was then to, then to see the diagnosis of the disease in 2018 and then 2019 the MSA. Okay, thank you. And Jim, how about you? Well, the first, uh, first, I've been diagnosed for about five years now, and it was mainly falling and the balance problem. But uh, I've noticed this past year has really progressed a lot. Yeah. Okay. It, it's ramped up somewhat. Yeah. Yes, but he is still walking, and I notice all three of us have a little bit different time frame, but we all seem to still be walking. That's, that, that is yeah. that is really, uh, I would say, very good. I mean, that's that. There's a lot about this disease that is not understandable, but given the timeline that you all have described as being diagnosed uh, and still walking, that's that speaks highly of care and medication and getting to the doctor on time and, and the sorts of things that are necessary to keep that going as long as possible. So it's good. I, uh, I had one. Oh, go ahead, Isabel. 
I think I still I think I still I can still work because I of all the exercise that we've been doing. Because my personal are getting weaker and weaker by the day. So if I was not exercising, I think I would be in the wheelchair right now. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. All right. Now there's a one a rather specific question, so I'll ask it of all three of you. The person asks, were speech problems diagnosed as spasmodic dysphonia? Were you ever told that that's what you had when a speech therapist or the doctor talked to you? Have you ever heard those terms before? You have not, Isabel? No. Kathy? No? No. Okay. So that would be one. And, and that does not mean that's not connected to the disease. If you've been told that is something, again, we would recommend you talk to your doctor get to a movement disorder specialist, whatever it might be, to get some clarification when those sorts of uh, diagnoses are made. Um, what educational resources uh, do you think are most helpful for MSA patients? So what are the educational resources that have helped the three of you the most? The MSA Coalition, <laughs> definitely. Okay. Um, the clinical trials have been very helpful. Uh, we started with the Michael J. Fox um, organization at the beginning, and that transitioned over to MSA Coalition. Um, our doctor has been very good. Our support group, we go to a Cure PSP support group. Um, and we don't go, we do it on Zoom now. Please. And um, they're very helpful and they do PSP, CBD and uh, MSA. And I can't say all those words. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, Larry, as you know, um, Jim's sister, uh, everybody needs a sister like her. Mm -hmm. She jumped on this um, immediately and has researched every single solitary clinical trial everything MSA can possibly give her. And um, she has really given all of that information back to us. And it's, it's wonderful to have a person like that helping us so much. It's very good. Yeah, it is good to have someone that's within the family or a friend that, that does some of that extra research and work as well. So you're right about that. Uh, any, uh, any specific resources? Uh, uh, MSA Coalition seems to be a primary one, but were there any, any others, Kathy or Isabel, that stand out for you? Well, some research papers I read. And how did you find them? I, that's something that I know a lot of people want to know. How do you find good quality uh, papers that outline symptoms, cures, whatever for this disease? What did you use? What, how did you go about it? I, I used them. Uh, well, I, I found them uh, because I'm a uh, I'm a researcher myself. I I uh, I can't access the library at the McMaster University. Okay. And uh, we found out who the, the author, the good authors are, and then we fix, you know, the researchers that are in the field. We found out about them, so we look up their papers. Okay. So one one very good way, if you if you uh, uh, didn't hear that please, you can look for papers from the doctors that stand out. And the doctors that are movement disorder specialists, uh, you can find them on uh, our website. You can find them in other websites. Uh, uh, a good movement disorder specialist, it's a researcher, probably does have a lot of papers out there uh, that you could find uh, using Google, Bing. Um, maybe then get to other resources that are uh, provided by uh, government or uh, medical societies, yeah. those could be resources for you as well. Kathy, anything to add? Um, I, it's the coalition and uh, all of the information that comes in, all of everyone that's, um, that participates on, on the Facebook pages, that's been a wonderful resource. Uh, of information too, um, and uh, the website, the coalition website. Okay, thank you. Um, 
somebody's asked, what do you do for dizziness? I didn't hear, I, I think uh, none of the three of you really struggle with dizziness, but do, if you do, what are things that you have found that help you when you get dizzy? I don't have dizziness. You don't? Okay. Isabel, do you have dizziness? Okay. And Jim, you said briefly you had a bit of dizziness and what did you find works for you, I think? Well, just standing still and hanging on to something. Okay. Hanging on. Um, it's not really just dizziness. It's more of a balance than that. Okay. Yeah, dizziness so, seems to be confused with uh, instability and, you know, dizziness of the whole house spinning around as opposed to just you can't quite get your feet set, you know, um, so that does I didn't make know if that was the difference. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that does sound sometimes when I listen to patients as part of a difference. Balance issues can seem like it's dizziness, but dizziness is truly a symptom for some people. And so again, I would say if you are having dizziness issues, you might want to contact your movement disorder specialist and see what they could uh, suggest for you. And they might do additional testing to see what it is that's causing that. We have one here from uh, a, a patient in Germany. She has MSA Sarah Beller, and she wants to know if you all have uh, problems with restless legs. And if so, what is it that you do with those? Do any of you have the restless leg syndrome that comes with uh, this disease for some? And if so, have you found anything to help you? Yes, I have initially. Initially, uh -huh. I have restless leg and my doctor put me on Cabidopa, Levodopa, control, control release. And Did that, that help? And it helped one pill. Okay. And uh, so that was prescribed Carbidopa, Levodopa for your, for your restless legs? Uh, control release. The CR. Okay. Not that not the normal regular dose, the normal regular pill. Okay. The Kathy? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. The, the, the control release. Have you been able to avoid having restless legs since? Yes. So that has helped you. Good. Okay. Kathy, how about you? Have you had restless legs at all? And if so, what has been found to help you? Um, I have. I do periodically. The doctor had pres prescribed gabapentin for me. I was it was I couldn't tolerate it um, what I do and find best is just massaging my legs uh, stretching uh, now I do not have this problem uh, chronically I find that it's worse when I'm uh, fatigued uh, but massaging my legs and exercising them stretching them helps uh helps me okay very good i have a i have a question here um from someone and this is uh what he is asked have your symptoms been level for all the years uh, he shares some of what his wife is going through and he's wanting to determine if her symptoms are accelerating or not so how have you three noticed uh, leveling of symptoms, and then maybe uh, I think I heard Jim say they've really begun progressing for him over the last year. What are the sorts of things that that have helped you keep them level? And then what kind of told you, oh, they're getting worse? Was there something that uh, happened, an accident, or did you just suddenly notice that they were ramping up for you? Uh, Isabel, we'll start with you, if that's okay. Uh -huh. We were walking, uh, like I noticed that I was getting weaker because on the treadmill, I couldn't go as fast as I used to. So even this year, um, I was going at uh, three miles per hour for 20 minutes, and now I can't do that. So so I know uh, for sure that I'm getting weaker. So are you seeing a slow, are you seeing like a slow steady progression or are you seeing a progression and then a, a decline and then a, and then a. It's a slow, slow progression. It's a slow progression for you. Okay, Kathy, how about with you? Yes, it has been a slow progression. 
Um, I must say in the last year, uh, my issues with breathing and gastroparesis have, um, have progressed. Okay. Um, I, it has been slow. It usually will creep up on, on me before I really realize, um, that it's, it's gotten worse. Okay. I, have, I have a lot of symptoms freezing. When I get up, I freeze. I can't walk. I can't move. And so now I'm doing a rehab program to help me with that. Okay. So the freezing has been more, getting more, I get more freezing. All right. Jim, Melissa? Well, I have, my progression has not been at all. This last year has been pretty bad. Okay. Seems to me. Okay. And so if you notice, if you notice that uh, and you in the audience, we have one that's uh, five years and he's seen a, a pretty good increase in the progression of the symptoms. Kathy has been nine years and now this year is beginning to notice an increase in symptoms. And Isabel, uh, diagnosed for two years, has seen uh, some changes in her symptoms as well. And that's one of the things that I, I think you probably have heard, and it's probably worth saying here uh, now, MSA is a snowflake disease. That's sort of what they call it because patients have some symptoms that are similar, some symptoms that are not, some that progress more quickly than they might for others. And what you hear from these three are uh, a part of the story. And again, if you feel like your symptoms are progressing rather quickly, you might again get a hold of your movement disorder specialist uh, and see what uh, might need to be done. Uh, let's see, we've already answered that. How does one get involved in clinical trials? What, what did you, uh, Jim, you were in a clinical trial. So what, how did you go about the process? What was the way you did it? So Well, through MSA Coalition and my sister, and, and clinicaltrials.gov. Okay. And uh, really just volunteering, signing up, they were more than receptive. Yeah, generally, good. you just, you know, click on the trial itself and send an email and give a little description about where you are on your journey. And, um, you know, then they call you back and then they start talking, you know, asking you all the pertinent questions. The, the problem with clinical trials is they have criteria and you have to make sure that you fit in the criteria. Otherwise, you know, it, it'll mess up their data if they include you um, and you're not in their criteria. So, um, you know, some are the longevity of how long you've had the disease and things like that. Um, but yeah, do um, the, your resources, no, your research page on the MSA Coalition is a good page to go to. And then the clinicaltrials.gov, type in MSA or write the whole word out and it'll pop up with things that are available. Okay, very good. Um, we had another question and that is, uh, and, and probably just in general, I, I heard one person talk about getting uh, gabapentin. Is there anything that you have found that is a, oh, and I think um, uh, Isabel talked about carbidopa levodopa. Have you found any medications that have stayed with you that have done a really good job during uh, the time you're in the disease or are the medications uh, changing periodically because of the symptoms or the, the, the increase in the severity of symptoms. What in general have you found that might be medications that, that could be shared? Well, I can go first. Uh, I've been put in Gravidopa, Lipodopa um, okay. in 2018, in the summer 2018. And I think it's made wonders, but now it's not working as well. Okay. And that, that is somewhat common for MSA patients who are placed on carbidopa levodopa, but it did help for a while. Yes, it helped. Okay. Kathy, you talked about, I think, gabapentin. Is that correct? Is that one yes. that has, what, has that been one that has been a plus for you to help you when you've had the symptoms that it addresses? Uh, no, I was not able to tolerate it. Um, I don't have a very good tolerance for medications. Um, so I am not on any medication at this time, except for 
um, some um, um, in, uh, gastrointestinal issues due to the gastroparesis. That's okay. the only thing I'm on right okay. now. And then I think if you remember, Jim was only on a couple of medications. Is that right, Jim? Yes, I was only one actually. It's a metadrine. Okay. It's blood pressure. It's for my blood pressure. And I've been on about six months to a year. Okay. And uh, seems to be working just fine. Okay, good. Um, here's another question. Uh, carrying information with you when you are going on a trip or going to the hospital or going out and seeing a doctor that is not uh, one that would normally see an MSA patient. So the question is, what do you all take with you when you're going to be uh, on a trip uh, and you're going to end up finding somebody that quite likely will not know what multiple system atrophy is? What are the resources or information you guys carry? Didn't, um, didn't MSA provide a card that gives a description of yeah. what the um, disease mm -hmm. is? And um, I was... I know that we were told that in case of any emergency, if he falls and hits his head or anything like that, to request a hospital to have a neurologist on duty. Um, it's, you know, so that a neurologist would look at him. Um, and I also carry a prescription list of all medications over the counter as well as prescribed. Um, but that's, that's about that little card is very helpful. Okay. And then the card and the medications. So you always yeah. have those available. Okay. Is there anything, Kathy or Isabel, that you would uh, carry with you when you're on your trips or move, going somewhere that um, you can share with people? The card. The card. And the the card. card. You found the card to be very useful. Okay. And Kathy, the same? Yes, and my neurologist's phone number. Yeah. Yeah, okay, very good. Have the phone number of your neurologist. And I think one other, if indeed, uh, just to add this in, I don't know if any of the three of you have uh, signed the paper for do not resuscitate, but if indeed you are a patient that has decided that uh, you do not want to have any life-saving uh, practices done, if you do happen to uh, have a, a major issue, then having that do not resuscitate paper with you is also very important. Uh, the health healthcare community, they're there to help keep you alive and uh, they may do things that you are not wanting them to do. So have that paper with you. Uh, we were told have it in your billfold, have it in your purse, wherever it might be. So those are the sorts of things I think that you might uh, want to have with you as you go on a, tour, on a trip. I, we have one more question I, we should ask. It's 11.57. Then I wanted to share one place on our website uh, that you all should be aware of. Uh, vision. Uh, that's one that's come up in a question. Do you have any problems with vision? And if so, what have you found to help you uh, as, as those problems have, raised, have, have uh, come about? Jim, any problems with vision thus far? Well, I haven't had any. All the time I would die diagnosed, but this past six, six months to a year, uh, I've been getting kind of blurry and watery eyes, but I haven't done anything for it. Okay. Uh, uh, Isabel or Kathy, have you done anything for your vision? Well, same, same. I've been, I've, my eyes are dry sometimes. But I think it's a representation of my medication. My medication is low, but uh, not something it's growing sometimes when I'm fatigued. Okay. And Kathy? Uh, yes, I have a double vision and I wear prism glasses. And um, I, in fact, got a, an increased prescription on them a couple of weeks ago. And um, I, they, the prisms really do help. Good. I also will add that um, if you try to go to an ophthalmologist or optometrist, whichever one it is, look for a neuro ophthalmologist. Yes. 
So they work neurologically and not just with your eyesight. Yes, that's, okay. uh, that's what I did. I saw a neuro ophthalmologist and um, they know exactly what to um, zone in on. Okay, very good. All right, I, this, it is 11.59 and I believe it is about time for us to close. And before I, I do and uh, thank all of these individuals, I wanna share my screen. I think we worked it earlier, I think it will work. Uh, and if it does, I want to just show you what, if you have not already found this, uh, what you might want to um, uh, look at. And that is, is the screen showing? Not yet. Oh, should be coming up. Oh, share. Ah, I got to hit the button. There we go. So you heard uh, Melissa uh, talk about uh, the treatment pipeline section of our web page. If you do and have not found this yet, you do want to learn more about clinical trials, just learn about what there is available for uh, any of the symptoms, really, uh, as well as uh, treatments that we're looking at to help address this disease as well. This is the multiple system atrophy page. It's called uh, the treatment pipeline. So we have all these articles that are provided for you to look at. And then down below, uh, we have this chart that has been put together. It divides the clinical trials into the various therapies, shows where they are, if they're in preclinical, all the way over to if they're FDA approved. In this particular case, if there's a clinical trial in progress. So those of you who are like Jim, very interested in not only seeing if there's something that will help you, but as Melissa said, help those in the future. I think this might be a place for you to turn to. And once you find something uh, that might address a symptom or that you wanna try to get into it to address the disease, then as Melissa said, go to the website, uh, click in there, you'll find uh, the connections to either through email or phone to get a hold of the uh, appropriate people and maybe get into a clinical trial that could help you. So I wanted to share that with you before we closed. I believe right now, at time as it is, we ought to be closing out. I want to thank each and every one of you for attending today and asking the questions. I hope the questions that we got to and the answers you received from our three patients help you as you go on your journey. I also want to thank uh, our three patients and one caregiver, Jim and Melissa. Thank you very much for taking the time and sharing what you had uh, to share with us. Isabel, I thank you for taking the time and sharing with us. And Kathy, thank you for the time as well. And uh, uh, Kathy and Isabel are, are a part of the coalition. Isabel is on our general advisory committee. Kathy is our patient representative. So if you have any other questions to ask, you can ask them. And Jim and Melissa have been kind enough to make themselves available at times. And I know I could always reach out to them if. Uh, uh, any additional uh, answers are requested of them. So thank you, everyone. Cassie, thank you for being our hostess today. And best to all of you. And uh, uh, do keep up with the MSA Coalition and the resources we do provide. So again, thanks, everyone. Have a good Wednesday. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.